Hey, I'm Brian Fenley, a golf broadcaster, also a commentator for Tennis Channel and Fox Sports Radio. And my guest today on my conversation platform, on to something where I look at sports media people and share their stories in a way that goes beyond just the confines of their work, is George Amir. He is an expert when it comes to live sports production, worked many years in golf, with the PJ Tour and PJ Tour Entertainment. He's a scratch golfer. And now he works with Quackman Productions as manager of production and business development there. We're going to share his story. Who a man went from a humble life growing up in Brooklyn, New York, and now has become a trendsetter in the business of sports media. Before we get started with my conversation with George, don't forget to subscribe. Here it is, my convo with George. Well, I'm not sure what my guest is better at, playing golf, he's pretty good at that, or live sports production. I think we're going to talk about both of those things a lot in our conversation. George Amir is with me. He is manager of production and business development at Quackman Productions, and we're going to share his story in a way where we learn what his life is beyond the scope of work. Obviously, we'll talk about his work as well and what he has done in sports, in broadcast, and outside the realm of that. I'm Brian Fenley with Tennis Channel, also a golf broadcaster. George, I'm excited to tell your story. I've had a, quite a few of your friends on, so it is going to be a blast having you on, and thanks for doing this. Oh, thanks, Brian. I appreciate it. This is going to be fun. It is going to be fun, and I want to go to a place that's going to start to be fun when we start to go into this realm of your life, and that would be golf. Golf is a big part of who you are. You've worked in golf for a long time. You also play a lot of golf and have played a lot and travel the world because of golf. What is the best round of golf you've ever played? Oh, that's a, that's a pretty easy one. <laughs> um, few few years ago, we a uh, group of my friends. I have a three buddies that um, we do an annual golf trip with. Went to Scotland and we played all the courses at St Andrews. And I played uh, St Andrews and I shot seventy eight at St Andrews. Wow! I parred fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, and eighteen coming in. So it was a blast. Especially around eighteen, there was about a hundred people surrounding the green, and I had about a ten foot putt for par. And I made it and big fist pump, high fives. It was a lot of fun. That was probably the best, one of the best rounds I've ever played. How good are you out of the sand? Not good. Uh, <laughs> I have my moments when I play really well. And then I'll have my moments when I will hit the ball first and it'll fly 50 yards. When you think about a comparison, a metaphor of say piping it down the fairway 300 yards off the tee in one of your rounds of golf, what does, in the work world that which you are in right now, what is the equivalent of fitting a 300-yard drive center cut off the first in terms of what you are when you are playing or performing at your best? What does that look like from a work perspective? Well, it's funny because I probably have never hit a 300-yard drive. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but if I did, um, I think that, just when you go to work and you just perform at the highest level, no matter what you're doing, and you come away, whether it's helping a client, um, you know, rolling up your sleeves and, you know, helping your colleagues, um, just whatever it is, you've got to give yourself, um, give, 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 it, you, give it your all. And that's, to me, the biggest thing is to go in each and every day and give 110%, uh, not only for yourself, but for your teammates. How early on in your life, even before what you're doing now with Quackman Productions, did you notice that even growing up in Brooklyn that you were giving it 110%? Where did that show itself early on in your upbringing? Well, I think it comes from my parents. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. My Both my parents had both uh, yeah, at multiple times worked two jobs to put us through Catholic school, um, you know, provide for us, my, my, me and my two siblings. And I think that work ethic um, it was instilled in me from a young age. And I always wanted to, you know, do my best, do it to the, um, give my 110% everything I did and to just continue to learn and grow and, 
you know, uh, be a better person. And that's really where the work ethic came from. How did your parents make it work with the multiple jobs? What did you learn from the way in which they had to make those sacrifices for you as a child? You know, I, I think when you're growing up in the environment, sometimes you don't realize it um, until later on. But, you know, we were five people in a two bedroom apartment with one bathroom. Wow. And you just you made it work. You had we had a schedule for the bathroom. You know, like when we got up in the morning, you know, my dad went to work. He was the first. He was up at five. Then my mom was up, you know, at six. Then she got, you know, myself up next and then my my brother and my sister. And then it was just a schedule. And that's how we did it. And, you know, you don't know any better because you don't realize what how other people are living because you're in that little environment there. And I think that that really, you know, propelled me into, you know, being prepared, you know, getting ready on time, you know, and making sure that, you know, you provide you, you, cause if you got up late, it's, it messed everybody else up. So you try to keep, every, you know, keep everything in, in, in running in form by, you know, doing your part and being part of the team. If you didn't have that upbringing, where do you think your life would be right now? Where do you think you'd be doing? You know, it's interesting. I, you know, I was the only one that went to college in my family. And, you know, you can see the difference in when you go to school and you, um, not that a blue collar life is a bad life. I'm not saying that, but there's a difference when you are, you have different perspective of when you hang out and go to school and you have a, you know, and you grow up that way. Um, and then I could see my sister and my brother, they had a totally different um, set of friends. And I, you know, worked two, when I graduated college, I worked two jobs. Um, I worked for um, Black Canyon Productions in the, in the mornings as a freelancer. And then I would go at night. They helped me get this job at night um, at Major League Baseball Productions in New Jersey. So I was working seven days a week, you know, sometimes 12, 15 hours a day, but I, I wanted to get ahead. I wanted to learn the TV production business. So that's what I had to do. And I did it. And my dad was like, well, you graduated college. Why don't you, you know, take the civil service test in for the city of New York? And I said to him, what if I don't want to live here? What if I don't want to be in New York where maybe I, there's a whole world out there that I haven't seen. And maybe that's where I want to go. And he kind of looked at me like shocked, but that's the perspective of when you have an education um, versus my siblings who just graduated high school. The idea of you sort of branching off from him, how hard was that as a child? Because obviously it's described the way in which your career took off, but we always want to sort of, in a way, we want to, to gain that validation from our parents. And when we don't agree with them or we see things differently, that could be challenging. We could feel guilty, but how did you maneuver that? Because it obviously worked very well. <laughs> Well, it's funny because when, when I was younger, my father's uh, siblings and his mom lived in Chicago. We used to go to Chicago to visit them in the summers. And I would always, I love Chicago. I love the city. And I always used to tell my aunt and uncle, oh, I'm going to go out here. I'm going to move to Chicago one day and I'm going to marry a girl from here. Well, be careful what you wish for, because <laughs> that's exactly what happened. I met my, my now wife in Chicago over th Thanksgiving break in 1995. And that's how I got out to Chicago. But I was kind of looking around. I kind of wanted to get out of New York. And she just happened, I just happened to meet her. And it was like perfect timing. So then I moved to Chicago, um, which wasn't too bad on my dad, because obviously I had family there. And, you know, he, you know, he, they were able to come and visit me. Um, but that's how, kind of how it started, just by meeting my wife. So I noticed a few things that as we sort of figure out you in a way that describes your story. Dreaming big from an early age and the idea of being open minded, which can take you into to places and walks of life that, that maybe you did not even envision. So having that open mind, going to Chicago and then making the next steps, how do you feel like that helped you sort of navigate as well, being okay with that which maybe you weren't accustomed to for the sake of learning, for the sake of growing. 
Yeah, I, you know, the thing about it is, you know, you, uh, along the way, you meet a lot of people. Um, and I've had a lot of mentors, you know, that helped, you know, when I first graduated college, I worked in a, uh, for sports marketing, um, small company, in, which is now big, it's called Steiner Collectibles. And he had just started the company. And he kind of took me under his wing, helped me dress and cut, you know, suit and tie. And he took me to custom shop. And I was really appreciative of all the opportunity that he gave me, you know, to help me. I mean, thinking back at it now, it's like, you know, that was tremendous, you know. And then, you know, sh you, you, we shared an office space with a couple of guys from, you know, that came and started a company from Major League Baseball. And then we became friends. And it's all about the relationships. It's all about, you know, learning and growing and taking taking those opportunities and just running with them. You take all of the experiences yeah. and you're able to use those to probably make those next decisions in your life. It's, it, it's like you hold on to them and they're a part of who you are. It's sort of like that, that mental passport that you carry with you. Maybe that sort of, that you were that you were saying in in the way in which you're able to now make decisions based upon those experiences. Yeah, I mean it's like you know um, you got to think and have an open mind uh, for everything, as you mentioned with an open mind. You know, like you you're faced at a task in your job. Um, you know, whether it was when I was working at Black Canyon trying to find film from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s from baseball players when we did one, it was a game. And wow. you had to think through and kind of use your head because we didn't have an internet back then. You had to make phone calls. You had to be a detective and you had to use your head and you use all your mental fortitude to kind of track all this stuff down. And that's kind of how my decision-making process works. It's like, you know, I try to figure things out as I go along. I may not be the smartest person in the world, but if you give me a task, I'm going to try to figure it out to the best of my ability. And same with decision making. You know, you kind of you put forth, and you come to a crossroads, and you got to make a decision. And I kind of try to weigh pros and cons, and then make the best decision possible. Not it's not always right. It may not always you know work out, but you at least have the ability to to keep an open mind to make the right to make the best decision that you can. What about all the pros that come with having worked at golf? Oh, well, I, you know, I, you know, got down to the PGA tour in 2001. Um, and I never thought that I would, you know, travel to like, you know, 10 or 15 different countries. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just, it was, it was a, one of the best experiences I've ever had. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Um, you know, I've been, I went to Monte Carlo uh, um, several times for a conference. I've been to Europe. I've been to Scandinavia. I've been to Australia three times. I've been to China, Korea, uh, in Malaysia. I've, you know, uh, Canada. I've been, you know, it, it afforded me the opportunity to travel and to meet people from all different cultures and some of which even though i've been gone from the tour for about four years now i still keep in touch with wow um, because it comes down to relationships you know the biggest thing is relationships and i you know this past i, I just was down um at the amex this past weekend and visiting with people from um canada that i haven't seen in a couple of years and, you know, we still keep in touch. Like it's like old home week, you know, and we share stories and have dinner and just, you know, laugh and have fun. And that's the thing I take away with it. You know, if, if I go back to Australia tomorrow, I can make 10 phone calls and have 10 dinners lined up um, with, with the, the, my former clients down there. So uh, that's what it afforded me. It, it also gave me the opportunity to see what other cultures are like. And and different things. And, you know, the bottom line is I, you know, when I say it to younger folks is that, you know, we, we get a lot of news and a lot of stuff that, you know, these people are bad or these people are bad, but you know what? People are people. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what you are, who you are. Um, it's, it's, it's the people that matter. You know, we all are the same.
that's the bottom line. And, you know, I treat everybody the same way. It doesn't matter who it is, you know, um, or, or matter what your job is. It's, you know, I just treat everybody the same way. And that's all that matters. By having that mindset, I would, I was going to ask you the, the way in which you have felt that preserving these relationships that have been with you for all these years, how you're able to sustain them the way you are, which when you say you go to Australia and you can call nine or 10 people right off your phone, having relationships, but then having them for a lifetime, what have you found has helped you sort of gotten it to that status where you can really do that with people? Well, I've always been a, the type of person that would reach out to people. So even when I was younger, I would call my cousins in Dallas and Chicago and California, and it just kind of was ingrained in me. And I always liked to keep in touch with everybody. So that's kind of like my MO. So, you know, even if it's just a text or, you know, a little, maybe an email, I, I try to keep it in touch with as many people as I possibly can, because one, you never know in the television business when you, you know, when you cross paths again, or maybe they know somebody that, that needs some help and you can help them out or the vice versa. So it's always good to keep, you know, keep those um, lines of communication open. And that's, you know, what I, you know, and I enjoy, you know, just talking to people and, you know, keeping in touch with everybody. How do you check in with yourself? <laughs> uh, sometimes it's just um, a Saturday morning walk down to, you know, get a cup of coffee by myself and just sitting on a park bench or by the beach and just, you know, just being quiet and just soaking it all in. That's kind of how I check in with myself. When you're doing that, where does your mind go? Is it reflecting? Is it trying to be in the moment? Where are you? when you're looking out and seeing the water and seeing the waves crash? I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's, um, you know, um, taking in the moment and seeing how, you know, how lucky I am to live where I live. And then also reflecting on all the, you know, things I have done in, in my life and what the opportunities that were afforded me and, and, you know, that I took advantage of them. You know, that's the biggest key is sometimes you're afforded an opportunity and people don't take advantage of it. And I feel like looking back, you know, I took advantage of a lot of opportunities and um, that were passed to me. I didn't pass them up. I do have a friend of mine who did pass one up and he never got an opportunity again. So I kind of wow. learned from that to not do that. So, you know, for me, I always took advantage of the opportunities that were afforded me and I never, you know, turned anything down. How do you develop those sensibilities to know like, hey, this is something that I have to take advantage of. And if I don't, I don't know what's going to happen next. For you to have that like inner moral compass, where did you find that that, that was established and that you were able to really hone in on that? You know, I, I'll go back to my first internship when I was in school and my junior year at St. John's. I had an internship at WPLJ radio station in New York. It was a top 40 station at the time. A lot of the people that worked there had gone to the same school I did and took the, had the same professors. But um, we started, I started out as a promotion in the promotion department. And, you know, the first day they wanted me to wrap Christmas gifts that listeners won. So sure, I'd wrap them up. Um, uh, oh, hey, stuff these envelopes. Sure, stuff the envelopes, you know. Some people complained. Oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. Well, I didn't complain. When it came time to do something fun and high profile, they came to me first oh. to ask me because I didn't complain. And then fast forward a couple of months later in April, one of the promotion um, um, directors left. They promoted a promotion manager and they, the director, executive director had called me into his office. And I was like, oh boy, what did I do? And then he said, he goes, hey, you know, so-and-so left, um, we're gonna promote, you know, um, this guy. And we wanted to know if you could take over for his position um, for, you know, for, you know, a couple of months. And, you know, like, and I said, sure. I said, you know, I, I'm gonna finish school. He goes, no, it's perfectly fine. He goes, but 
he goes, we need something, somebody, it gives us four months to get somebody in the position. So mm. you're, you would be great. So I went from an intern to an employee. Wow. Um, and I took advantage of the opportunity. And so from there, that's how I met Brandon Steiner. From there, that's how I met George Roy and, and Steve Stern from Black Canyon. And that's the snowball. All from that one opportunity became the wow. whole snowball effect of how my career started. It's interesting because I don't think a lot of people realize how one little decision like that in their life can set the tone for so many others to happen. And as we wrap up this conversation, George, for you to be able to have that knowledge and seeing, wow, I said yes to this, I acted this way. And there wasn't just a present reward, but in the future, it sets you up as well. And that idea, as we look at some of the key principles of who you are, it's the taking advantage of opportunities, it's the open-mindedness, it's the traveling, it's the hard work, it's all of this. And, and I think about you and, and this last question here as George Amir is with me, I'm Brian Fenley. And I think about what that young child version of you would be when you're seeing your parents work two different jobs to make ends meet, five people in a two bedroom house and to see where you are now what about it to you, even though I just laid out all of these principles that you have, what about it still astounds you that you've been able to do this? Uh, yeah. It's just, uh, you know, uh, when you think back of, you know, in, in that position, I think that, you know, my parent, my parents sacrificing to put me through Catholic school, private school. Me, you know, doing my homework, working hard, you know, even in high school, I had a job, you know, I was on the bowling team, so I had no time to really kind of screw up. So that's really where it starts. It's like, you know, you kind of have that focus to succeed. And I think deep down, you know, I didn't want my, not, you know, not that my parents had a bad life, but I didn't want that life. I knew there was something better out there. And that's what I was striving for, I think, subconsciously, because now I think, you know, when you think back at it and reflect on it, yes, I mean, that's probably what this whole thing was all about. But I, you know, you know, going back to taking advantage of opportunities, I always strove and I always tried to do my best, whether it was in school, whether it was on the bowling team, whether it was at work, whatever I was doing, I always strived to do the best I could and give 110%. Because I knew that if I did that, good things would happen. And along those lines, given of all those things that you just mentioned, I would think subconsciously that idea of not wanting to let them down might have been a part of, of that inner drive for you. If you think about what propelled you and, and where you are today, given what they were able to sacrifice for you, knowing that and you wanted to show them that you weren't going to let them down because they didn't let you down george amir he is outstanding he is a master when it comes to live sports production a good golfer would love to get out there on the course with you one day a manager of production and business development at quackman productions i'm brian fenley with with golf broadcasting and, and tennis channel and, and other affiliates george thanks for doing this this was fun thanks brian i really appreciate it, it was fun